Let me start by saying that Deus Ex has always held a special place in my heart. The original was a seminal game for me that I still cherish to this day. The second game was the first ever episode of Errant Signal I ever produced. The third game was the first ever season of Spoiler Warning I was on. So the whole series has been, in one way or another, kind of a big deal for me. It's also a series that has never really been given a fair shot on this show, with both Invisible War and Human Revolution getting episodes back when the tone was more yuck-yuck joke reviews than more meaningful criticism. So I was really looking forward to giving this game a fresh, proper, critical look. But I'm not sure I can, per se. When I went to my notes and started outlining my script, I realized it was basically just Human Revolution again. Mechanically, the game hits all the same notes. It's surprisingly faithful to the original game's emphasis on player choice and problem solving, but is constrained by modern development costs and design conventions. That is to say, instead of solving big problems with tons of approaches and optional objectives like infiltrating Liberty Island or finding the heart of Area 51, Mankind Divided asks you to go from A to B through a level, but lets you pick from a few paths as you go. It feels like the original Deus Ex's design edict of levels need to be problems to solve, but not puzzles, has kind of been boiled down to levels need to be completable through stealth, exploration, and or combat. The original Deus Ex leaned hard into emergent design as part of an immersive sim aesthetic, and that's been chopped down and de-emphasized pretty much across the board here. While Mankind Divided can sometimes surprise you with the amount of levels you can skip or avoid entirely compared to other shooters, its levels are also constrained enough that they often feel like repeatedly choosing whether to hack a door or find a vent, shoot a guy or hack a door, find a vent or shoot a guy, over and over and over. I'd almost argue it's less of an immersive sim in the Deus Ex, System Shock, Bioshock vein than a Metal Gear Solid-style action-stealth narrative game. They even have a sort of VR missions side game built right in. Seriously, Mankind Divided owes more to Hideo Kojima than it does to Harvey Smith in terms of design, and this is way closer to Metal Gear Solid V than it is to, say, Dishonored. If there is a big mechanical change from Human Revolution, it's more structural, introducing a pseudo-open world hub in a way that's reminiscent of this year's Mirror's Edge. Prague is a city broken into chunks that serve up a bunch of optional quests, exploration-driven mini-gameplay chunks like sneaking into an apartment or two, and most of the exposition and plot. But this approach ends up bifurcating the gameplay. Most of the game's dialogue and role-playing happen in the open world, while the away missions focus on the action stealth stuff almost exclusively. And for Deus Ex, a game that was all about your choices reverberating throughout, and emergent gameplay that had systems crashing into each other in interesting ways, it makes both bits of the gameplay ring a little bit more hollow. Your style of completing away missions and the paths you take through the levels mean very little to the story outside of a curt recognition of lethal or non-lethal. Nice work, Jensen. You must have been quiet in there. Tarvos hasn't reported anything. I like to get answers without creating new questions. Do those state police jerks give you any grief? It's like you said, they shot first, so I took care of it. Oh, uh, okay. Good. They had it coming. And your role-playing choices don't really change how you approach the action bits. You don't start a level in a compromised or more advantageous position because of your dialogue options or bringing a certain item with you or anything like that. You do occasionally get to choose between conflicting missions, which is neat, but there's not really any consequence to any of it. It doesn't impact the story overall, you just pick which mission you want to do and the NPC you didn't help and will never see again gets mad over the radio. So, yeah, generally choices don't really impact the story, and the story doesn't really impact the gameplay. The end result is the gameplay kind of feels modal. Heck, you literally have an action outfit and a role-playing outfit. And again, that leans Mankind Divided away from immersive sim design goals. But ultimately, it's probably the closest analog to Deus Ex you could hope for in modern times, short of, you know, going back and playing Human Revolution. Or playing the original Deus Ex, for that matter. As a modern echo of Deus Ex's design methodology, it plays fine. If you liked Eidos Montreal's last approach to this material, you'll probably like this, but it's definitely tracking away from what made the original a game lots of people loved. Mechanics aside, though, Mankind Divided has trouble separating itself from Human Revolution's thematic problems, running into more or less the same issues. The key difference is that instead of augmentation standing in for pretty much any issue, it's a divided society that stands in for pretty much any issue, the game's a jumble of references to Black Lives Matter, Apartheid, Jim Crow laws, immigration issues, xenophobia, and Islamophobia, but it has no interest in examining any of those weighty and worthy topics in depth. Like Human Revolution, it's about a ton of stuff and fits and spurts, but by refusing to engage with its own themes, it's ultimately about nothing. Your friends are out there intimidating Augs, preying on their fears of getting deported. And it seems like you're part of that. 
It's a vapid, airy game that wants you to think it has stuff on its mind when really it has very little to say. And I really didn't want to write that piece again. I already wrote it, about human revolution. The only difference would be that this one would have fewer jokes. So I thought maybe this time instead of just complaining that Deus Ex doesn't say anything, I'll try to look at how it fails to say anything. How precisely does Deus Ex manage to present this surface level illusion of depth but ultimately convey so very little? Well, for one, it knows what symbols are but doesn't really know what they mean or how to use them. The whole Adam Jensen is Icarus slash maybe an angel thing is perhaps the best example of this. They've been using this iconography over and over again for the past two games. You see it alluded to in Jensen's Icarus augmentation, in the title song from the previous game, in their montage at the beginning of this game, and all over their advertising. And it doesn't really make any sense. Like, how is Adam Jensen an Icarian figure? Icarus was full of pride and hubris, and it led him to try to achieve impossible things, which led to his downfall. Adam Jensen, famously, never asked for any of this, and at the end of each game always gets his man. Not really an Icarus-y falling based on pride. You could argue that maybe Adam Jensen is a stand-in for humanity writ large, but that doesn't really work either. Mankind didn't reach for transcendence and then have a great fall, they just sort of got, well, divided. If anyone was striving for more than they could realistically achieve, it was the Illuminati, who had the whole let's control human evolution thing blow up in their faces a bit. But if that's the case, Adam Jensen is perhaps the worst person to use as a symbol for their hubris, so why is he the one in all these pictures and not, I don't know, Manderly? Worse, the original Deus Ex already used a reference to Icarus, and it did it correctly. First, the Illuminati developed an AI called Daedalus, which is named after the father of Icarus in Greek myth. Then the Daedalus AI went rogue and escaped onto the internet, and the Illuminati built a replacement based on the original tech, but with more constraints, and named it Icarus. So, yeah, the Icarus AI was the son of the Daedalus AI. That tracks with the myth. Later, when Icarus and Daedalus are combined, they make Helios, an AI named after the god of the sun, which is kind of important to the whole Icarus story. Helios was the AI that was the key to Bob Page's ascent to digital godhood, beyond even the Illuminati's control, but that ascent was thwarted by J.C. Denton. When my augmented systems like yours are complete and able to be integrated with Helios, I will burn like the brightest star. You're gonna burn, all right. So, hey, there you go. In his hubris, Bob Page tried to fly too close to the sun and got burned. The AIs track with Bob Page's Icarian myth. It's not exactly deep or profound symbolism, but it works. It makes sense. That's how you do an illusion. And if you don't know how to use symbols, you're going to be in big trouble when your game is a giant science fiction allegory. Which is why the Augs as subclass thing never really resonates. It's not just that the game doesn't establish which particular minority they're supposedly an analog for. There's nothing wrong with looking at oppression as a generalized concept. But to do that, you really need to look at oppression, really get inside of the systems that drive it. This is a game, after all, and put forth something that looks at those systems. Instead, the game systems are, well, pretty much exclusively action, stealth, RPG fare. The only real oppression mechanic is getting hassled in the street, but still being immune to local police prosecution, so, you know, whatever. Really, Mankind Divided uses overheard conversations, barks, and quest-giving dialogue to do most of the thematic heavy lifting, leaving both the main plot and the core gameplay free to be conspiracy action fun. This was also the case in Human Revolution, and I think that's the core reason these games are so devoid of meaning. Like, look at the way NPCs in Mankind Divided call Augs Clanks. You don't belong here, Clank. Santo built housing just for you types. Why don't you stay there? Unless you're looking for trouble, keep moving, Clank. Great. Another one. Getting to be as many Clanks here as in Golem. Hey, does anyone hear a clanking sound? The slur generates texture to the universe, but not meaning. It shows that there's animosity against augmented people, but because we can't react to a bark and we don't see Jensen or anyone else react either, we don't get a sense of severity or context or hurt or weight. Just, this guy calls Og's names. Worse, by condensing most of the thematic exploration to overheard blurbs and quest-giving text, you end up with shallow exaggerations to quickly convey points of view on a topic. So NPCs tend to come off as either bleeding hearts in full support of Og's, I've got to say I admire you. What you did to your body took guts. You have no idea how many people just look the other way. But we can't afford to. Not Augs, and not anyone else. What happens to one happens to all of us. Or actual genocidal racists. They know it's Talos Raka, but they can't get to him though. 
because he's hiding in that rat hole protected by all his augmented psychopaths. Well then, why don't they just bomb Golem City? Blow it off the map? There may be some innocent people who die, but it's a small price to pay. The checkpoints in this city are a good idea. They keep everybody where they belong. I've never been poor. The thought of it frightens me. Poor people think that not having money is normal. And all of that stuff is just floating around in the background of Jensen's universe with very little comment from the main game as you do ninja spy stuff. Heck, the legislation driving the plot of the whole game, the Human Restoration Act, is less about the philosophical discussion of the forced apartheid or relocation of people, and more about giving all players in the story a MacGuffin to chase after. It motivates pretty much every main player to do stuff, but it isn't really discussed in and of itself. Mankind Divided isn't interested in digging into what causes oppression, or what happens to the oppressed, so much as it is interested in using the idea of a split, oppression-ready society as a cool setting for its action stealth adventure. There's corpses everywhere. A lot of your cousins are here too, Jensen. You want me to grab you any spare parts? No parts, but I take mine with cream and two sugars while you're asking. And that, I think, is the core of why Mankind Divided, and big AAA games in general, struggle to be about very much. Big budget games are pleasurable power fantasies about being a cool dude or a cool lady first and foremost, and pretty much anything else is a secondary consideration. The Icarus stuff gets to stay because, well, it makes Jensen that much cooler and that much more pleasurable to use as an avatar for a little while. This mentality makes dealing with real-world issues extraordinarily hard because you can never drop the power fantasy angle. Every action needs to be fun and empowering and rewarding! That doesn't mean it can't also be intellectually stimulating, but the intellectual stimulation has to be worked in around having a player-centered man-shoots or action game or platformer. Symbols can't perform their symbolic duty if it interferes with play. Human Revolution was about augmentations, yet we never got to experience a single downside of them. They didn't cost Jensen any money, he doesn't need neuropazine to deal with them, he says they took forever to get used to, but we never got to see that. We just see him instantly emerge as a superhuman, more or less out the gate. And they're used to make Jensen into a super cool murder machine, but still acceptable to look at in public, unlike those bad guy augmentations. In a game about the pros and cons of augmentation and transhumanism, it should be a red flag that we never got to see any of the cons for ourselves. Mankind Divided is about a majority oppressing a minority, but we never really felt the brunt of that. Our papers always checked out, no one at work was actively hostile to us, police didn't actually enforce the AUGS only line at the metro, we were never forcibly relocated to Gollum City as a permanent resident. We are always special, exempt, above it all, even as games purport to put you in the middle of things. I see. Thanks. You must think you're something special, eh? Get the hell out of here! Eight for seven? Kurva! What the fuck are you? Some kind of a super soldier? What I am is in a hurry. Yes. Yes, I bet you are. Go ahead, you're clear. Themes get to exist only insofar as they don't make us feel sad, or frustrated, or angry, or inconvenience in any way the sense that we are a super exceptional superhero. Jensen can't actually be a member of an oppressed underclass that bears the full brunt of the bigotry the game suggests exists, because that would get in the way of you being the ultimate super cop badass. Jensen can't recoil in terror at his augmentations, they can't be framed like Deus Ex's body horror, because these augmentations are the things that make you super cool. So he just sighs, and he says he never asked for this, and he mopes a bit, but it's cool, because you're cool, and you're Adam Jensen. And I don't think there's ultimately anyone to blame for this. Power fantasies are the core defining aesthetic of almost all big budget game development. This is why most huge games that want to bring up serious topics or serious ideas end up with that oil and water approach used by games like The Last of Us and Max Payne 3, where a simple third person shooter is dressed up with cutscenes in between murder sprees to make it about something more. Meanwhile, games that can't do that, like Deus Ex or Fallout, just end up paying lip service to serious ideas without meaningfully examining them. It is hard to to speak truth to power or discuss the nature of power when your game is itself a celebration of unrestrained and unexamined power. It's hard to find the value of brotherhood and unity in the face of all this bigotry the game throws at you when you've spent the last 10 hours killing and knocking out people. Whatever morals the game itself has come from you. They're part of the power fantasy. The game doesn't tell you what it thinks of mandatory relocation of Augs to Gollum City or the Illuminati elites manipulating the world. You get to tell it what you think through Jensen's dialogue choices or mission selection. There are no easy answers, Doc. If the Augmented are behind this, maybe they felt it was their only recourse. 
Or maybe terrorism would stop if the ruling class realized how often their own actions contribute to it. This isn't accidental, either. There was an interview on Gamma Sutra with Mary DeMarle, the game's narrative director. In it, she says, quote, Because one of the precepts of Deus Ex is, we don't tell you what to think. You have to make your own decisions. You live it. And we try to present all sides of that issue to you. What we're trying to do here is tackle deep issues and show the world is shades of gray, and always allow the player to decide, not try to inflict a judgment. It's a game about nothing by design, a game that confuses not taking a position for having a nuanced view of the complexity of real issues. And for the record, a game doesn't have to be about anything deep or profound. I loved the new Doom, and Doom had very little to say about current events or, well, much of anything other than our deep need for catharsis every once in a while. In fact, it spent much of its runtime mocking those who would confer deeper meaning onto it, and that was one of its many charms. But Doom doesn't evoke Greek myths, or pretend to have deep symbolism, or use culturally charged imagery to evoke apartheid, or Jim Crow, or Islamophobia. It doesn't evoke this illusion of depth. And that's what makes Deus Ex so egregious. It purports to have symbolism, it purports to examine real cultural issues, it purports to be telling a serious story for serious grown-up people. But really, it's smarty person symbolism in politics stuff as a theme the way that Destiny uses epic space operatics as a theme, and it's explored about as deeply. In a year that has seen the release of The Division, I can't possibly say that Deus Ex is the most offensive or careless in its use of cultural iconography. Indeed, a lot of care was put into making sure it said about as little as possible in order to avoid putting off or offending players. But that puts it in its own class of games, I think. Not a tasteless mess like The Division, but a game that aspires to nothing more than intellectual vapidity with a veneer of depth. It's like opening a theme park that has the roller coaster of class warfare right next to bumper cars that try to teach you about racism. But bumper cars where you get to choose whether racism is good, of course, because this is a bumper cars that's interested in showing reality as shades of grey, and doesn't want to inflict a judgement. In Mankind Divided, the focus is on fun in a way that doesn't just do disservice to the topics at hand, but trivializes them in an effort to get the game to be taken more seriously than it deserves to be. And as enjoyable as it is to play, and it is fun, and as much of an affinity for the Deus Ex series as I have, and I have a lot, I do think that warrants some base level of contempt. Wait, wait, can I just point out for a second that the Icarus augmentation is what prevents you from having a Calamitous Fall? I mean, is, is that supposed to be ironic, or is it really just that bad of symbolism and naming? I just, I, uh, I really hate the Icarus thing. I really hate the Icarus thing.